Good morning, church. I am Jaylene, and I'm going to be giving our morning announcements. So firstly, we want to welcome Pastor Hank Johnson. He is the lead pastor at Harrisburg Brethren in Christ Church up the street. HBIC has been a friend of First Church over the years, and we are happy to welcome him back. Next week, we have Reverend LaDonna Sanders Nicosi preaching the word. Reverend LaDonna has visited us a few times in the past, and she is the director of the Church of the Brethren Office of Intercultural Ministries. We are excited to have her back, and she will also be leading our morning Zoom study at 10 a.m., so don't miss it. And as things seem to be opening up more and more, and we seem to be coming to the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, we want to hear from you and how you feel about us meeting as a church. A survey will be distributed asking for your feedback, and we need to hear your voice. In the near term, we are going to be meeting outdoors in the parking lot every first and last Sunday of the month, and we will worship virtually for the weeks in between. At least that's our plan for April and May as of now. However, you can look forward forward to BCM Peace's first fundraiser of the year, which is the virtual Highmark Walk for a Healthy Community. Please make plans to donate, become a virtual walker, or to form a team. Also, please join us for our other virtual event featuring some young and up-and-coming leaders in our community on April 16th at 6 p.m. More details about that event and the Highmark Walk fundraiser can be found at bcmpeace.org. And lastly, please continue to stay connected with one another. Call each other and check in with each other. And even though things seem to be loosening, please remain wise in your decision making and stay safe. If you or anyone connected with our church needs help scheduling their vaccine, please contact the church and we'll be happy to assist. Let's remain safe, remain connected, and remain the church that we all know and love. And now for a special announcement. Good morning, First Church. I just wanted to give you a little update from the search committee slash discernment team. Uh, We've been working diligently Um, trying to get things ready as we search for um, the new team member for our congregation. I want you to know that um, our congregational profile is complete and has been distributed to the district. And we're also done uh, with the job posting that has now been distributed as well. So I just wanted to let you know that good work is being done. And I want to uh, just ask each of you to be in prayer Uh, that the the Lord would even now be uh, just preparing the right person um, to to come alongside us, to come and be a part of this faith community, to be a part of our family, um, and and, uh, a part of this wonderful journey that the Lord has us on. Um, So I just thought I'd give you that update this morning uh, so you can continue to be in prayer and so we can all uh, start getting excited for what God's going to do right here in our midst. And with all of that, I I want to ask you all to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Good morning, First Church of the Brethren. It's so good to be together this morning to praise the Lord in spirit and in truth. It was so wonderful to be together in person on the back lot last week to celebrate the resurrection. And we do look forward to being together once again uh, in a couple weeks. Um, So uh, just please make plans to be with us um, in two weeks. This week we are very excited to have uh, Pastor Hank Johnson bringing the word today. And uh, we hope that we have open hearts and open minds to receive that word today. As we're uh, gathering this morning, we want to invite you to greet one another in the chat text message each other, just to let each other know that you're happy that each other is here today to praise the Lord, even as we recognize that the Lord has us on a journey, and he's brought us this far because we've been believing in him, we're trusting in what his word says, we're trusting in all of his promises, and we're recognizing that our Lord has never failed us, and he never will. So let us sing, we've come this far by faith as we greet each other in the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. Hallelujah. Amen.
inside, I was working on the outside that brought about a change in my life. And, and um, for us today, there, there is that joy because we know that the victory is ours. We know that no matter what it is that we're going through, that God's already working on it. Um, sometimes for some of us, the, the, the victory is already like apparent. For some of us, we're, we're still in the midst of, of, of the battle. Um, but regardless of where uh, we find ourselves today, there is joy in this place yeah. as we gather to praise the Lord, to give him the praise that he so richly deserves. Let's praise him today, church. We know where we're 
we're supposed to go, and so we just kind of walk, and we're, we're very, uh, you know, almost defiant in some ways about um, where we think we should be going. Uh, but that word says we should walk humbly. So that means we should see where God's leading us, and we should go with him. And uh, this, this song is, is one that we love here at First Church, and it just says, Jesus, we want you to walk with us. Um, we really want you to go out ahead of us to show us where to go. Um, but all along our, our journey of faith in this world, we know we're just passing through. But we do want to make a difference for your kingdom right here and right now. We want you to walk with us. So sing with us, church, as we acknowledge that uh, through our trials, uh, through the things that are difficult in our lives, we want our Jesus to walk with us today. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Help us to 
walk, Lord, um, on that path that you've marked out for us, Lord. Even if we don't see where the path is heading, Lord, we know that, that those mountains in front of us are going to move out of the way. That you're going to make a way where there is no way, Father, for each one of us. Lord, help us to, to, to strive after your, this calling, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for moving in this place. We give you the worship that you deserve. In Jesus' name.
even in our best of friends in this world, let us down from time to time, but you never do. And uh, your son, when he went to, to be with you, he said he would send uh, a guide, he would send a, a comforter, he would send the Holy Spirit um, to, to move us in the right direction, to guide us, to give us discernment. And Father, today we just pray that your spirit would flow among us. Lord, even as we acknowledge that you are God, even as we acknowledge that you are alive, we know that um, nothing in this world can be accomplished um, by our own strength, but only by the power of your Holy Spirit that dwells among us, Father. So we just um, offer ourselves to you that you might use us the way that you want to use us, Father. Even as we acknowledge um, your Lordship over all creation, um, and as we acknowledge that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord, we just pray that right now your Holy Spirit will flow right here, right now, move us in the direction you want us to go. We love you, we thank you. Thank you. 
give you the praise you're so deserving of. Father, we thank you for this, um, this urging that we would follow in your way. And, and just knowing that we don't need to do that by ourselves, but we have brothers and sisters and siblings all around us to, to go on this journey together. And uh, even above that, Lord, we have you walking with us, your Holy Spirit to guide us to urge us, to, to nudge us forth, encourage to, to, uh, to beat out any of the fear, any of the doubt, and not knowing the way. You said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the way. We want to follow your son, Jesus Christ, who is Lord today. Lord, we're going to continue in our worship as we bring you a portion of all you've blessed us with. We want to uh, just offer our very selves to you, that you might use us as you see fit. We offer you our time, our talent, as well as our finances today. We lift up Sister Linda, who's bringing in special today. We also lift up Melissa with the Time for Young Disciples, and of course, Pastor Hank, who's bringing the word from Harrisburg Brethren in Christ Church. Lord, we just thank you again for this time of worship. Uh, we, we just pray that you'll give us open hearts, open minds to continue in this worship today as we give you a portion of what you've blessed us with today. We do acknowledge today that you are Lord. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
Hello young disciples. As many of you know, I recently went on a trip to Ghana, West Africa for a few weeks and I have brought back the church a little surprise as well as you young disciples and I just want to talk to you all about it. So in case you didn't know, Ghana is located in the western part of Africa closer to Nigeria. It's only a few countries away. So if you remember when Pastor Josiah went to Rwanda, it is in a different part of Africa. Um, and it's also used to be known as the Gold Coast because they were very rich in gold and other resources. It's also known as the first sub-Saharan nation to break from colonial rule. So it's time to show you my surprise. I got this art piece for the church of the Asante warriors. These warriors were mighty and protected Ghana from those who wanted to take their land. The Asante people have a large impact on the Ghanaian culture from the Akan symbols, kente cloth, and the language Chui, one of the most spoken languages in Ghana. Would you like to learn a word in Chui? My first word that I learned was Akwaba. Akwaba. That means welcome. And if you ever go, you will hear it a lot. People will say it to you all the time. Um, but back to the warriors. So there was something special about a specific warrior. And that was Ya Asantewa. She was nominated by a number of regional Asante kings to be the war leader of the Asante fighting force as the first and only woman in Asante history. She showed more bravery than any other warriors. She was at the war front at different times to give advice and refresh supplies for the Asante fighters at the age of 60. This was unheard of for a woman to be in such a position. Ya Asantewa is a very important role model and an inspiration to girls and women in Ghana and throughout Africa because of the bravery she displayed. A lot of women who go into professions that were previously dominated by men are often nicknamed Ya Asantewa as a way of encouragement and support. We also think of warriors as war and fighting. But what would it look like to be a warrior of Christ? The same passion and love for her homeland and the people and the bravery and the fight to do what's right. She stood up against evil forces that were against them. Today, we'll be talking about pursuing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly. This is what we need to do as warriors of Christ. We need to take that negative connotation of warriors and flip it upside down. We are warriors of Christ and we do not fight, but we heal. We use spears to break the chains of injustice and free captives. We are wrapped in the armor of God and pray before each daily battle. We are fighting for justice and peace and equality for all of God's people. So I want us to look Look at this art and remember the bravery of Ya Asantewa and the purpose we have now to be warriors for Christ and fight for justice and equality. Now, I want you young disciples to help me choose where we should put this painting, where in the church. So please let myself or Pastor Josiah know where you would like to see it hung and send us an email so that next time we are all together in the church, we can embrace it as one. Lord, let us pray. Lord, I thank you for these little warriors who are so brave and ready to do your will each and every day. They are lights. They are glowing with humility, love, conviction, and hope. I pray they wear your armor and not fight, but heal. In your name, amen. And the tree word for goodbye is nante ye. So nante ye, young disciples. Micah 6, 1 through 8. 
is if you listen to the Lord's message. He says to me, Stand up in court, let the mountains serve as witnesses, let, and let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear the Lord's case, your mountains. Listen, you age-old foundations of earth. The Lord, the Lord has a case against his people of Israel. He is bringing charges against them. The Lord says, My people, what have I done to you? Have I made things too hard for you? Answer me. I brought your people out of Egypt. I set them free from the land that they were slaves. And I let Mo Moses to lead them. Aaron and Miriam, Miriam helped him. Remember how Balak, the king of Moab, planned to put a curse on your people? But Balaam, Balaam, the son of Beor, gave them a blessing instead. Remember their journey from Shittim to Geigal? Geigal? I want you to know I always do what is right. The people of Israel say, what should we bring with us when we worship the Lord? What should we offer to the God of heaven when we bow down to him? Should we take burnt offerings to him? Should we sacrifice calves that are a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of lambs? Will he take the light in 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we offer all the our older sons for the wrong things we've done? Should we sacrifice our own children to pay for our sins? The Lord shown you, has shown you what is good. He has you what he requires of you. You must act with justice and you must love to show mercy. And you must be humble and live in the sight of your own God. May God put a blessing on this reading of this word or something like that. First Church of the Brethren. It's a joy and a blessing and a pleasure to be with you all. I am recording from um, in-house here at Harrisburg Brethren in Christ Church here in our sanctuary. Uh, what a blessing to worship. You know, this has been a really hard year, year plus, and we've all had to get really creative with how we rush, uh, worship, whether online or in person. Um, but this is such a blessing because we still get to worship our God together. And the psalmist remind us, you know, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. So in this special, unique way, I'm very, very grateful to be with you. Uh, we have now entered the season in the worldwide church um, in the historic church as well. That's called Eastertide. You know, we've come through Lent, which is a season of reflection, um, re repentance, restraint, reconciliation, and really focusing on what it means to take up our cross and to, to find Follow God, what it means to be faithful to God. Uh, and we also had this tension in Lent where we have Jesus, you know, um, after the 40 days in the wilderness, yes, but also Jesus marching towards Calvary's tree. 
Uh, then we have Resurrection Sunday and Easter morning. And, and I love how the historic church made Lent season uh, of sullen reflection almost 40 days. But Easter tide, which runs from Easter Sunday to Pentecost, is actually 50 days. So you get more days to celebrate. Um, and I think celebration is a, is a discipline. I think celebration is a, something we're all needing to do, especially in this last year. Uh, plus, we've had, I think, two big things that have at least dominated for me has been COVID-19, you know. Uh, it's impacted home. It's impacted our workplaces, our schools, our, our churches. Um, but another part of the thing that's really impacted us, at least in, in my thinking, is has been racial injustice. And I think it's, 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 it's always been there, because we'll talk a little bit about the American story, but I think it, it's showed up in, in unique ways. You know, there's a lot of angst, a lot of anger, a lot of stress, a lot of unknown, but, but also a lot of people who want change, right? A lot of people who want um, active change that's happening, not just on a national level, but on our local level, in our families, in our churches as well. One of the things I've been reminded, though, with holding on to, to some of the, the impact of this COVID-19 and, and some of the impact of, of, of the racial injustice that maybe more of us are seeing now, is to just stop and, and to take a breath and to remind yourself that our Jesus, our Christ, is still Lord of heaven and earth. Amen? It's to remind us that Jesus' love has led us in the past, it can lead us now, and it'll lead us in the future like it always does. Because Christ is still risen, and in some traditions we say he is risen indeed. But in these two things, you know, and especially with the racial justice component, one of the things I found myself asking is, is you know, where is God in this? When we think about justice, you know, we've been thinking about where is God in this? One of the things that's really, really interesting is that um, in 1878, uh, I think it would be my grandmother's, my maternal grandmother's grandfather, you know, looked around this country and, in, and he really recognized that it's hard to be a black man in America. And he recognized this in 1878. He had been enslaved, he had earned his freedom, he had fought in the Civil War. Sorry, he wasn't an Anabaptist. It took a couple of generations for us to come on board, right? Um, he had fought in the Civil War, he had earned his freedom. He was trying to, to, to build a home for him and his family in South Carolina. But with, with the rise of the KKK and the, the rise of, of really, you know, the, the white church and, and what he saw wasn't really Christianity, he kept asking himself, where is God in this? Because it's hard to be a black man in America. And in 1878, he got on a boat and literally sold everything he had, got on a boat and sailed to the unknown that, that actually had been established as, as Monrovia, Liberia. And then, so that's a, a very, um, uh, it's been, it was heavy on my head, uh, in my mind, all of 2020, because I find myself thinking, like, am I getting to that point where I need to pack everything up and actually go back home because I was born in, in that same Monrovia, Liberia? And the reason I think I started asking, where is God in this? Not so much with COVID, but when it came to, to racial justice or injustices that I've seen, is because I think America has always had this, this, this historic, and, and, and even in our present, about how our Christianity hasn't really looked like Jesus. You know, a contemporary of that, uh, uh, I guess would be my great-great-grandfather, is, is, is the very famous Frederick Douglass, who once says, I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land. I look up uh, this land, Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. Right? So that's historic. But in the present, in 2019, a year before 2020, there was a nationwide survey that said that 86% of white evangelical Protestants and 70% of both white mainline Protestants and white Catholics said this, or agreed to this, that the Confederate flag is more of a symbol of Southern pride than racism. When it came to racial justice, you know, some of them even said nearly two-thirds of white Christians overall said that the killings of, of African-American men by police were isolated rather than a part of a broader pattern of mistreatment. So Christianity has always had this problem, not just historically, but also presently, about how our faith, our church, has not looked like our Jesus. George Whitefield, another historic person in, in American Christianity, condemned the cruelty of slave owners and, and, and actually evangelized so that people would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. 
But he also campaigned for slavery's legalization in the colony of Georgia. Or Jonathan Edwards, who many consider one of the greatest preachers on this land, pressed for the evangelization of enslaved, but he too owned slaves. So you have this historic tension, but also this present tension that it keeps bearing, or at least rearing its head. You know, Robert P. Jones in a, a book called White Too Long says, the more racist attitudes a person holds, the more likely he or she is to identify as a white Christian. So this is kind of what some of the stuff I was dealing with, right? How do we reconcile a legacy of a, a church in the South that is more known for the lost cause, advocating Jim Crow, and fighting civil rights for African Americans, for black people? Or a Northern church is more known for our silence and continue segregation because Sunday morning keeps being the most segregated time in America. How do we reconcile all these things to a God who says, I want justice. I want you to do justice the way I do justice, to love the way I love, and to walk in peace. And this wasn't the first time I asked this question. So I thought to myself, when was the first time I really asked this question that I can remember? When I was 16 years old in 1999, there was an immigrant from Guinea um, who was actually raised in my native Liberia. And his name was Amadou Diallo. Um, Amadou Diallo, if you know the story, in February 99, he, um, he was an unarmed African American or black man who was tragically killed. And as I watched those scenes unfold, I started asking this question for the first time. Does America care about black death? Does the church, do Christians, where is the justice, mercy, and peace in this? And as I was wrestling with all these things, starting in the spring of 2020, going into the summer, the Lord kept calling me back to the prophets. And as I drew back to the prophets, I was struck by one prophet. A verse that I had memorized in Sunday school growing up came alive in such a good way. And I'd like to go back to that passage this morning by reading and, and sharing the rest of this message on Micah 6, um, verses 1 to 8. I'll be using my own translation. Um, I had to suffer through Hebrew in seminary, so this is my best bet to remember um, some of those things I learned there. So it might be slightly different from whatever version you're, you're reading, but I would humbly say that this is probably more right. Probably not, but that's what we have. Uh, Micah 6, starting at verse 1. Please hear what the Lord God has to say. Stand up and plead my case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's case. Listen, you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord God has a case against his people. He will be proven right before Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? How have I grieved or offended you? Please testify against me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and from the house of slavery, and I ransomed you, and I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, please remember what Balak the destroyer, king of Moab, plotted against you, and how Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous act of the Lord God. With what shall I come before the Lord God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Shall I come before him with cows a year old? Calves a year old. Will the Lord God be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give up my firstborn for my rebellion? Shall I give up the fruit of my body for the sin of my entire being? And then the Lord answers, doesn't he, in verse 8? He has made known to you, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require and ask from you? To do God's justice, to love the way God loves, and to walk in shalom humbly with your God. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much that you have called all of us to do justice as you do justice, to love mercy and love the way you love, and to walk in peace with you with creation, with others, and even with ourselves. So God, help us to answer this call. For if we were put on trial for the justice and the injustices that we've kind of done for centuries upon centuries in this land, Lord, we would all fall short. Lord, we would fail as a church. But Lord, help us today 
to be encouraged and to take up our cross and follow you and to take up this command that you give to Micah and the first believers centuries ago. Let it be a call we answer today to do your justice, to love as you love, and to walk in peace with you and each other. In your holy and precious name, amen. So Micah is writing this, 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 this whole book or, or, or this, this biography and also a accumulation of his, his sermons. And as he's writing, I think it's important for us to understand that, that Israel has been split into two. In the Old Testament, Israel has made this covenant and this promise with God where God says, if you're faithful to me, I will bless you and you will be my people. But if you're not faithful to me, if you continually break my covenant, you will lose not only connection to me, but you will lose your land. And God basically is telling Israel to keep faithful for centuries upon centuries, for leaders upon leaders, not just in a political realm or, or with kings, but also with these prophets. And the prophets would come and try to pull the people back and pull the people back. But sin and continual sin for centuries has split Israel into the northern kingdom and now the southern kingdom. And because of the sin of Solomon, because of the sin of the people, we have these two kingdoms. The northern were, were ten tribes who would reject Solomon's son Rehoboam and, and the southern were Judah and then, and then Benjamin. And on the scene in this book of Micah is the prophet Micah. He's a contemporary of Isaiah, right? I think it's always funny we say the major prophets and the minor prophets because we, we have more text of one. But I think Micah was very much a major prophet. He comes, though, from this small village of Moresheth. And what's interesting about this chapter that we just, uh, the first eight verses of this chapter, is that Micah is not just delivering a message from the people. He's actually being Yahweh's voice to the people. Remember, Yahweh wasn't just the name of God. It was a title of God, but it was also a promise of God. Because Yahweh meant that God has been with us. God is with us now. God will be with us. God is with us in this. Yahweh gives his voice to Micah. And when he gives his voice to Micah, and this is what struck me as I was going through 2020 of how does America still not care about justice for people who look like me or justice for all the marginalized in this country? Because here are some of the allegations that he makes against God's people. Micah steps up using God's voice and says that these are the things that God is holding against you. And in the book of Micah as a whole, God almost comes down like from Sinai, not just to give the law, but this time to give judgment. And what is he giving judgment over? Well, they had leaders who became very rich by taking advantage of the poor. They had a society where the rich was getting richer and the poor was getting poorer and the rich was getting richer off the backs of the poor. They had prophets who were corrupt. They had promises that were made for the rich and, and the rich only or, or promises that were fulfilled for the rich and the rich only. They had leaders in the synagogues and among the people, but also politically, who violated God's law. And God kept saying, if you break this commandment, you break this covenant, judgment is coming. But the, the, the beauty of Micah is that though there's sin, though there's judgment, God's salvation is always on the way. And so you have kind of all these things coming to a head in Micah chapter 6. Because in this passage, God puts his people on trial. God looks around and says, you know what? We've been uh, going through this for centuries now. So I'm not going to claim you. You haven't seen it all. But you know who has the mountains and the hills? They will be my witnesses of how I've been faithful for centuries. They will be my witnesses because I was the one who pulled you out of slavery in Egypt. I was the one who redeemed you and brought you to the promised land. I was the one who's given you leaders for centuries, including from the very beginning. I gifted you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. I I want you to remember your journey. Remember the work I've done for you. Remember how faithful I have been. Remember your journey into the promised land. Because you have not been faithful. This is why when you come to me with empty worship, I do not receive it. This is why when you come to me with empty pledges, I do not receive it. This is why when you come to me with empty promises, I do not receive it. Because what do I want from you, my people? I want you and I'm inviting you to do justice, my justice, mishpat. 
to do mercy, or the, the Old Testament calls it hesed. Sometimes it shows up in the New Testament, maybe more familiar to you, as agape, to do mercy, which is to love the way I love you. And to walk in peace, to walk humbly, to walk in shalom with God. Remember, shalom was this all-encompassing context that, that invited us to walk peacefully with God, yes, to be made right with God, to be made right with creation, to be made right with one another, to be made right with ourselves. And the question becomes, how can we be Christians in a country that continues to reject justice and call ourselves followers of God? Because what God has shown us is that in the face of injustice for centuries, he expects us to be doing his justice, to be loving the way he loves, and to be working for peace. For blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be children of God. Our work, my sisters and brothers, is justice, mercy, and peace. Whether it's in 2020 or 1878, whether it's in 1619 or, or 300 BC or, or 300 AD, our work is justice, mercy, and peace. Because our God calls and expects us to look like God and not our world. John, who's Jesus' best friend, the one who probably knew Jesus the best, when he writes his epistle, he says, if you do right, you look like God our Father. If you don't do right, you look like your father, the devil. And he picks that up even in his gospel as well. But in 1 John 3.10, he basically boils it down to this. If you do right, if you do justice, if you do right, you look like God our Father. But sisters and brothers, if we're not doing God's justice, if we're not living to do right, we are not only not looking like God our Father, but John, the one who knew Jesus the most, says, if you don't look like God the Father, you look like your father, the devil. Because justice is not just what we see in the Torah. Justice is not just what we see in Deuteronomy 24. Justice was law, yes. But justice was also the idea of making things right. And what I love about the Old Testament law, yeah, we're centuries removed, right? And we like to think we're so advanced. But when you dig in the Old Testament law, not only will you learn a grace that was above contemporaries, not only will you learn a grace that was above every other uh, known tribe or people at the time, but you will see a God who consistently fights for the marginalized, fights for the oppressed. But you see a God who calls his people to not just fight for justice, but to make the world more just. And I love this idea of mercy because it's hesed, right? It's this idea of loving the way God loves. One of the, the best descriptions, I think, of, of all of Israel in the Old Testament, God calls them his treasured possession. This idea that, like, you know, the treasured possession, understand, the way I understand it was that, like, you know, if you are, are blessed to have a budget every month and you have, you know, money that's going out, money that's saving and, and bills and all that, but it's that little bit of money that's left over. Maybe for some of us, when we're starting out, it's $5, $10, $20, whatever that little bit of money that you can just share on yourself, right? And the joy that you get from that little money in the budget that you can just share for yourself, right? That joy that you get is your treasured possession. And I love that when God looks at his people, he says, the joy that I get, that greatest joy that you experience, that's who you are to me. But I want you to remember what I did in Egypt. And you remember that when the people come out of Egypt, it's not just, right, that the Israelites, as we think of, are Jewish people. It's everyone who believe. And, and Egypt is still in Africa. And we believe this happened before the Arab invasion. So there's a good chance that even when the Israelites leave Egypt because of faith, people who look like me were part of that tribe as well, right? And as they go up to the promised land, God puts his call on them that you are to remember the immigrants, that you are to remember the poor, that you are to remember the oppressed, Remember to marginalize and do justice for them because I saved you from the same. You are to be a light of the world. You are to be my light of the world. And then God calls us to peace. That is all of us. None of us can escape this call. All of us are called to make peace in our world, to be peacemaker, to walk with, to hear, to listen, yes, 
but to actually do this active work of peace. That's what he called them back in Micah's day, and I believe that's what he's calling us today. So what's our reaction to injustice in the world? Do God's justice. Love the way God loves, and make peace. Shalom with your brothers and your sisters. So when we say, what does God require of us today? I think there's four things I want you to hold on to. One is to look like our God. And the way we look at our God is, is by doing what our God does. We have Jesus Christ as our ultimate example, as the Lord that we worship. What does it mean to look like our God? It means to, to crucify our privileges. It means to work to make things right. It means to be willing to lay down our lives for one another. It means to see the world as, uh, and know the world is not as it should be, but to work to make it possible to be the world in God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Doing God's justice, doing God's mishpah is making things right. So if there's darkness in the world, or God is calling you to shine light there. If there's brokenness in the world, or God is calling you to bring healing there. If there's, if there's people who are struggling in our world, or God is calling you, as our African brother St. Augustine reminds us, to be a home and a hospital there. Because when we shine our light, when we, empowered by the Holy Spirit, bring reconciliation and redemption, when we are able to bring mending and healing, as that light shines, our world sees it and glorifies our Father in heaven. When we want to know what does God's justice look like, may we be reminded of Matthew 25. The Jesus who says, yeah, what you do to the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the stranger among you, those who love them are those who love me. And this Easter season, I was reminded that Jesus is not just using this great metaphor or analogy, because on Calvary's tree, he was hungry and his body was the only bread. He was thirsty, and all they could give him was, was, was wine mingled with gall to drink. He was naked, and not only was he naked before them and vulnerable, but they sold and gambled his clothes in front of him. He was a stranger, the God of this world, left not just the city of David in Jerusalem, but a city of God, and went outside the city, and then he was killed as a stranger, because in that context, Roman citizens couldn't be crucified, so he's killed unjustly, yes. As a stranger in his own land, in his own city, he's murdered. But when we look at what God calls us to do, is this reminder that those of us who are welcoming the immigrant, who are working for justice for the marginalized, who are feeding the hungry, who are clothing the naked, who are protecting the vulnerable, who are visiting the prisoners, we are the ones doing God's justice. Because all of us are called to love the way God loves. So my challenge for you this week is to simply ask, how am I loving my world in a way that looks like Jesus? And for some of you, that's a big question. And for some of you, maybe it's a practical thing of saying, how am I loving the people in my house that looks like Jesus? How am I working, loving the people on my block that looks like Jesus? How am I loving the people in my workplace that looks like Jesus? How am I loving my family members that looks like Jesus? How am I loving those I disagree with vehemently that looks like Jesus? How are we loving to look like Jesus? I talked about Hamadou Diallo in 1999. And, and back in 99, we had these cool things called WWJD bracelets, right? They were the coolest, right? I think that was actually one of my early entry points to Anabaptism. This idea of what would Jesus do was more than a matching bracelet for me. It became this haunting question of, but what would Jesus do? But I think as we look at ourselves, as we look at our families, as we look at our neighbors, as we look at our workplaces, as we look at our world, may we be leading Jesus' lives. I mean, what would Jesus be or what would Jesus do be shining in our lives? Because sisters and brothers, all of us are called to walk in shalom. Again, the shalom that God talks about is harmony. You know, it's like peanut butter and jelly. It just goes together. 
right? It's like sweet and spicy. Doesn't make sense, but it's delicious. It's like kale, which is that wonderful superfood and my trash can, right? They just go perfectly together too. But shalom is this idea of making things right, living in harmony with God, with others, with yourself, and with creation. Shalom is our work. So I want to ask you, and I want to end asking this question. Not only how are you loving God, how are you loving creation, how are you loving your sisters and brothers, how are you loving yourself? But I want to ask you, if God was to put you on trial like he put Israel, his people, on trial in Micah, if God was to ask you, are you living to bring my peace to your world? Are you living to bring my peace to your family? Are you living to bring my peace to your neighbors? Are you living to bring my peace to your workplace? Are you living to bring my peace to yourself and within yourself, to others around you? Are you living to bring my peace? For the call that channels, the Yahweh channels through Micah, is a call I want to sound out to all of you. This is the work. I'm glad to know many of you at First Church who are engaging in the work. I'm challenged by so much of what your good people are doing. But this morning, I want to push you along a little bit further and just ask that question. Are you living to bring God's justice? Are you loving the way God loves? And are you bringing peace in our world that so desperately needs it? Amen? Amen. God bless you all. Micah 6, verses 1 to 8, God puts his people on trial and says, man, you fell short. Man, you keep falling short and you're not following me. Even when you come to worship me, you're not giving me your all. If you want to know what I want for you in this world, it's simply to do justice the way I make things right, to love the way I love, and to work and walk in peace 
with me, with one another, with creation, with yourself. That is the work, sisters and brothers. That is the work we're called to do. That is the work I pray we're doing. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for your blessing. We thank you so much for your healing. We thank you so much for your love. Lord Jesus, our Christ, we thank you for your example. And we pray for your help as we seek to make justice in our world. Lord, where there's injustice, help us to fight for your justice. Lord, where there's brokenness, help us to fight to bring healing. Lord, where there's darkness, help us to shine our light there. Because God, when we're doing your justice, we're looking like you, we're healing our world, we're shining over darkness, and we're showing the darkness in our world that the light is not only always already shining, but the light ultimately wins in the end. And Father God, help us to love as you loved. Help everyone we come in contact with, we speak to, we engage with. Those in our lives, those in our families, those in our workplaces, those in our neighborhoods, those in our world. Help them to know that by knowing us, they can know you because of our love. Let us love to show that we belong to you, Jesus. Let us love to show that we belong to our God. Let us love to make and help usher in with the Holy Spirit. Your kingdom come. And Lord, we pray for peace. Not just a peace that lives in our head, but a peace that we work with with our hands. Not just a peace that resonates in our heart, but a peace that resonates in our lives. Lord, help us to be children of peace. For the peacemakers are the ones who seek you and the ones who see you. So let us be workers along with the Spirit. Let us be this church. Let us be the church that is working to bring shalom between us and God, us and creation, us and one another, and yes, Lord, even in ourselves. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our God of justice. Thank you for being the Prince of Peace. In your holy and precious name, amen.